now we will discuss about the chapter a quick synopsis of the chapter digestion and absorption what is digestion now why should we carry out digestion because we need to convert whatever food that we consume that is complex food substances into forms that can be absorbed into the blood stream now why should they be absorbed into the blood stream because they need to be transported to the different cells in the body so digestion ensures that the complex food substances are broken down into simpler absorbable forms and where is this process taking place this process takes place in our digestive system it may involve certain mechanical methods of digestion such as chewing the food isn't it which is a mechanical digestion or it would be churning the food using peristalsis which is the movement of the digestive tract the muscular movement or the majorly it may involve biochemical method which is enzymes the enzymes in your saliva the enzymes in your gastric juice in your pancreatic juice they all mix with the food and they break down complex substances into simpler substances the process of digestive uh, digestion takes place in digestive system it includes our digestive tract which is also called as the alimentary tract alimentary canal and associated glands so a quick view of our alimentary canal you know that our alimentary canal is roughly a tubular structure of course there are regional anatomical and uh, uh, histological variations in this uh, tube like structure which extends all the way from the mouth to the anus so this is referred to as the digestive tract or the alimentary canal and you can also see a lot of glands which are associated with it for example here you can see in your oral cavity you have the salivary glands in your abdominal region you have the liver and the pancreas and within the stomach there are gastric glands and within the small intestine there are intestinal glands so alimentary canal includes both the parts through which the food passes as well as you have the glands which pour out their secretion mostly exocrine glands which pour out their secretion into the lumen of the alimentary canal which mixes with the food and which helps in the process of digestion so one by one let us look into what are the parts of the alimentary canal like i said it starts with the mouth and it opens out through the anus so we have a complete digestive system because in animals you know that there may be complete or incomplete digestive system so we have complete because it starts with the mouth and terminates in the anus and you know that your mouth opens into a huge cavity that is referred to as the buccal cavity or the oral cavity after that you swallow the food with the help of your throat and then the food is pushed into your food pipe that is esophagus and then it enters your stomach which is a j shaped muscular bag like structure and then it passes through the narrow tube which is the longest part of your digestive tract which is the small intestine and then you have the broader tube which is referred to as the large intestine and finally the undigested matter is ejected out through the anus now let us look into a brief overview of the mouth or the oral cavity now this is the mouth or the oral cavity and notice that just inside the mouth there is a slit like space between the mouth and the gums of your teeth and this space is referred to as the vestibule okay and then one more thing you will notice here is inside your mouth on the floor of your mouth you have the tongue so this is the tongue which occupies the floor of your mouth and the roof of the mouth is referred to as the palate in the front the roof of your mouth is very hard it is referred to as the hard palate because it is bony in nature and posteriorly at the back of your mouth the palate becomes soft it is referred to as the soft palate and if you open your mouth and look into it you can see that there is a small worm like body which hangs down the the soft palate at the back of your mouth and this is referred to as the uvula okay now another thing is if you look at underneath your tongue now see this picture over here underneath your tongue there is a fold of the mucous membrane which connects the floor Uh, the tongue to the floor of your mouth and this particular structure is referred to as the lingual frenulum 
okay so basically in your mouth at the floor you have a tongue a tongue the tongue is a highly muscular organ in the roof you have the palate the front part of the palate is hard the back part of the palate is soft and hanging down the soft palate you can see a worm like appendage which is referred to as the uvula and like i said underneath your tongue there is a fold of the mucous membrane which connects the tongue which anchors the tongue to the floor of your mouth which is referred to as the frenulum if you look at the upper surface of the tongue at the part of your tongue slightly behind the front region there is a v-shaped fold which is referred to as the sulcus terminalis there is a groove which is v-shaped and the parts which lie in front of this is referred to as the anterior part of the tongue which is a part of your buccal cavity and behind that we say it is the posterior or the back of the tongue one important thing you have to all remember is now if this is your tongue the upper surface of your tongue is thrown into minute finger like projections which I am showing you here and so that means your tongue is not an even surface the lower part of your tongue is even but the upper part of your tongue has these fine finger like projections which may vary in their shape and these projections are referred to as the papilla now the papilla contains special sensory organs which are referred to as the taste buds which are gustatory in function now let us do a quick uh, review of what are the different types of papillae very close to the back of your tongue near this v-shaped groove which is called the sulcus terminalis you can see these papillae which are about 8 to 10 in number but they are broad disc like structures so if this is the back of your tongue probably they are broad and disc like projections which are present at the back of your tongue and from above if you look at them from above they look like disc like structures and these are referred to as the circumvallate papillae the circumvallate papillae are 8 to 10 in number and they have lot of taste buds in them they have about 100 taste buds per papilla and you can see how there is only a limited number of them at the posterior side of your tongue okay in front of the circumvallate papillae very poorly developed in the sides of your tongue you have these papillae which are referred to as the foliate papillae but the foliate papillae are known to die down they are known to degenerate in the later stages so they are not identified in the tongue and then if you observe there will be pink colored spots on your tongue and these pink colored spots which are present on your tongue which is very clearly identifiable even through the naked eye is referred to as the fungiform papillae they are basically like a mushroom that's why they are referred to as the fungi form papillae the projections on the surface of the tongue if you take a section of the tongue they have a fungus like appearance and that's why they are referred to as the fungi form papillae all of you remember if this is one papilla and this is the next papilla you can see a depression between the papilla in the depression you have these special cells which are referred to as the taste buds which give you the sense of taste and fungi form papilla also are uh, uh, quite abundant but le lesser abundant in compared to the most abundant papilla which are small filamentous papilla so you can say that these are filamentous like this okay and these papilla are referred to as the filiform papilla and the filiform papilla do not have any taste buds but they only have touch receptors on them the tactile receptors on them next to the filiform papilla you have the fungiform papilla which have limited number of taste buds per papilla but like i said it is the circumvallate papilla which are most uh, which are least numerous because there are only about 8 to 10 papillae but they have the most number of taste buds that is 100 taste buds per papilla okay so this tells you one thing that on your tongue that is the upper surface of your tongue you have projections you have folds of the mucous membrane which are referred to as the papilla and now we have classified those papilla into four types circumvallate foliate which do not last long which degenerate and which are present on the sides of the tongue just in front of the circumvallate papillae fungi form which appear as pink or red spots on your tongue and filiform papillae which are the smallest of papillae the most widely distributed which do not have taste buds their only function is the sense of touch okay 
we have teeth in our mouth and the teeth also help in physical digestion that is chewing the food and uh, the mode of arrangement of the teeth in our oral cavity is referred to as the dentition human teeth is called thecodont because it is present in sockets of the jaw it is not directly attached to the bone of your jaw why do we say we have heterodont teeth because you know that we have different types of teeth we have incisors for cutting the food we have uh, canines for tearing the food we have molars and premolars for grinding the food and we develop two sets of teeth that is before 10 to 11 years of age we develop the milk set and after that we develop the permanent set so the milk set is deciduous it falls off it is replaced by the permanent set and therefore since we develop two sets of teeth in our lifetime we refer to our dentition as diphyodont so remember human teeth are thecodont because teeth are located in sockets or alveoli of the jaw bone uh, sockets or alveoli of the jaw and not directly connected not directly attached to the bone heterodont because there are different types of teeth and diphyodont because we develop two sets of teeth one is the milk teeth or the uh, temporary set or the deciduous set and the second one is the permanent set which is referred to as the adult set okay teeth are derived from both ectoderm as well as mesoderm and like i mentioned we have milk teeth or temporary set and uh, generally there are 20 in number now i will come to the dentition or the dental formula a little while later before that let us look into the types of the parts of the teeth, the part of the teeth which is exposed from above the gum level is referred to as the crown. The white part of the teeth, the hardest material in the human body is the enamel. The enamel is secreted by certain special cells which are located here. These are called ameloblasts. Inside you have a structure which is highly perforated. It is called as dentin secreted by cells called odontoblast. And then you have the cementing substance which holds the teeth in the sockets of the jaws. And then you have the innermost sensitive portion where you have the blood vessels and the nerve endings which is referred to as the pulp so what all portions are embedded in the alveoli or the sockets of the jawbone is referred to as the most importantly the root of the teeth and also you can see these small outgrowths or small bulged portions of the enamel these are the portions which help the teeth to grind the food and these are referred to as the cusps and that's why we say these cusps are very shallow and very rounded and we say that human teeth are bunodont type because we have very very shallow cusps on the surface the small outgrowths of the enamel and that makes enough surface area to grind and chew the food okay and i told you about the dental formula for the dental formula all of you remember when you consider the dental formula you take into account a numerator and a denominator the numerator is half of the upper jaw the denominator is half of the lower jaw so please remember when you write the dental formula you are not considering both the upper jaw and the lower jaw you are i mean the entire upper jaw and the lower jaw you are taking into account one half of the upper jaw and one half of the lower jaw when you do this now how many teeth do you find in the adult set if you were to write the <coughs> dental formula of the adult set then it would be two one two three divided by two one two three that is in upper half of half of the upper jaw i will have two incisors i will have one canine i will have two premolars and i will have three molars okay similarly in one half remember i'm not considering the whole upper jaw and the whole lower jaw it is half of the upper jaw and half of the lower jaw so again on the lower jaw also there will be two incisors and one canine two premolars and three molars so this is the adult dental formula if you were to consider the dental formula of a child that is of a milk set it would be 2102 divided by 2102 now what is missing in a child the premolar is missing so remember in order to write the dental formula the numerator represents half of the upper jaw and the denominator represents half of the lower jaw Now coming to the throat region, we are done with the oral cavity. Behind in the throat, all of you, you can see how your throat 
and the back of your mouth is divided into three parts the portion of your throat which communicates with the back of your mouth is referred to as the oro oropharynx the part of your throat or the pharynx which communicates with the nasal cavity is referred to as the nasopharynx and the part of your throat which communicates with the voice box or the larynx is referred to as laryngopharynx so here they have colored the different portions to give you an idea this orange part which is the part of your the back of the nasal cavity which is communicating with the pharynx is called the nasopharynx and then you have the oropharynx which is the back of your oral cavity communicating with the pharynx and this is actually the laryngeal region and this part of your pharynx is in communication with is in uh, is very close to your larynx and that's why it is referred to as laryngopharynx we also have tonsils at the back of our mouth and the mode of arrangement of tonsils is such that it forms a hypothetical ring like structure and that ring is referred to as the valdez ring so let us see where the tonsils are present in our uh, throat region now at the roof of our nasal cavity you can see there is a tonsil that is present it is called the pharyngeal tonsil which is called adenoid then just below the pharyngeal tonsil there is a tiny tonsil sitting here very close to an opening which comes out of your middle ear it is called the eustachian tube do you remember so eustachian tube this tonsil which is located very close to the opening of your eustachian tube is called the tubal tonsil so remember roof of your nasal cavity at the back end of your nasal cavity is the pharyngeal tonsil or the adenoid tonsil and slightly below that near the opening of the eustachian tube you have the tubal tonsil on the sides of your oropharynx that is the part at the back of your mouth that communicates with your throat or the back of your mouth which is a part of your throat called oropharynx on the sides you have the palatine tonsil on the either sides and at the base of your tongue now this is the portion that is located behind and base of your tongue which has the lingual tonsil so this is the side view that is shown over here and this if you look at it from the front when a person is uh, opening his mouth you can see that on both sides you can see the representative tonsil and if you join them it forms an imaginary ring or a hypothetical ring which is referred to as the valdez ring now moving on to the stomach so obviously you know now that once you swallow the food that is a, a process called deglutition the food passes through your food pipe or the esophagus and then it ends up in your stomach so now see how the stomach is opening i mean the esophagus that is bringing the food down from your pharynx is opening into your stomach the portion of the stomach into which the esophagus opens is referred to as the cardiac part of the stomach so this is the part of the stomach that receives the opening of the esophagus the bulged part of the stomach is referred to as the fundus the main part of the body or the main part of the stomach is simply referred to as the body and the narrowed end of the stomach is referred to as the pylorus so what are the four parts of the stomach the first part is cardiac part then the bulged part of the stomach called the fundus then the major part of the body i mean the major part which is itself called the body of the stomach and lastly you have the narrow end of the stomach which is called the pylorus and you can see a ring of muscles over here a valve that is formed a sphincter a sphincter is nothing but a ring of involuntary muscles okay and these ring of muscles will regulate the movement of food to and fro from the esophagus into the stomach and they will prevent the regurgitation of food from the stomach back into the esophagus this is called the cardiac sphincter or the gastroesophageal sphincter you will find another ring of muscles which form a valve like sphincter between the pyloric region of your stomach and the first part of your small intestine that is called the duodenum and this is referred to as the pyloric sphincter and all of you are aware that the inner wall of your stomach is not even but there are folds on the inner wall of the stomach and these folds which are present on the inner wall of the stomach these are referred to as the rugae okay in between the folds there are depression and the depression between the folds are what is referred to as the gastric pits and it is in this gastric pits that you find the gastric glands which are what we are going to discuss in the next slide before that let us finish the anatomy part of it so we saw that the stomach opens into the first part of the small intestine which is called the duodenum notice how the duodenum is forming a c shaped loop over here and then after this purple portion which represents the duodenum the middle part of the small intestine is referred to as the jejunum and the last part and the longest part of the small intestine is referred to as the 
ileum and then you know that this ileum opens in two so see here let us let me show here if this is the ileum um, it is opening into a sac like portion of your large intestine now this sac like portion of the large intestine into which the ileum opens is referred to as the cecum and here at the cecum you find a blind ending worm like projection which is referred to as the wormy form appendix and wherever the ileum now suppose this is the ileum the ileum is opening into this cecum i told you the cecum is the first part of the large intestine and then there is a worm like projection called the wormy form appendix here between the ileum and the cecum you will find another ring of muscle which is called the ileocecal valve which regulates the movement of food from your ileum into the first and the expanded part of your large intestine which is referred to so this portion of the large intestine is called the cecum and then you can see how the large intestine continues further up and this part of the large intestine is called the colon so there is an ascending colon and there is a transverse colon which runs sideways and a little distance later you can see that the intestine takes a turn and it starts running downwards and this is referred to as the descending colon the descending colon leads into a s shaped colon called the sigmoid colon which opens into a temporary storage organ called the rectum and finally the rectum opens out through an opening called anus so remember there is cecum and then there is ascending colon and then there is transverse colon and then there is descending colon so transverse runs horizontally ascending and descending run uh, vertically upwards ascending and vertically downwards that is transverse colon sorry uh, descending colon and then the s shaped colon which is called the sigmoid colon and then this rectum and finally it opens out into the anal canal the small canal is the anal canal which opens out through an aperture called the anus so remember that is it is in this first part of the small large intestine which is called the cecum where you find lot of symbiotic microorganisms which help in digesting our food mostly we find e coli okay so remember the cecum is the site for many symbiotic microbes histology of elementary canal if you take now you know that your intestine is a tube like structure now here what we have done is we have taken a section of the tube now if you take a section of the tube now this is what the section of the tube looks like obviously if it's a tube and you have cut it it is usually appearing circular in outline the outermost layer is a very thin epithelium called serosa the middle layer after that we shall always start from outer to inner okay inner to the serosa is the muscular layer muscular layer has inner circular layer circular layer means if this is the tube if this is the small intestine the circular layer has muscles which are oriented along the circumference of the intestine like this and longitudinal muscles are those which are along the length of the small intestine so two types of smooth muscles you will find in the small intestine some of them are oriented circularly these are referred to as the circular muscles in the wall of the small intestine some of them are oriented longitudinally along the main axis of the intestine these are referred to as the longitudinal muscles so two types of muscles are found circular muscles and longitudinal muscles and these circular muscles uh, are inner they look like striations as seen over here and they in the longitudinal muscles appear like blocks okay so outer longitudinal inner circular both these are referred to as muscularis to be very specific they are referred to as muscularis externa so remember muscularis externa is entirely made up of smooth muscle cells then inner to the muscularis mucosa you can see this area which is made up of loose connective tissue it is actually uh, sorry not loose connective tissue it is dense irregular connective tissue is what you find in this and this particular tissue or layer is referred to as submucosa in the submucosa you will find certain glands and these glands which are present in the submucosa have secrete a lot of mucus and these are referred to as the brunner's or the brunner's glands 
So remember, in the submucosa, you have mucus secreting glands, which are referred to as the Brunner's gland, and the submucosa is present inside the muscularis layer. These two are the muscularis layer. This one is the inner circular. This one is the outer longitudinal. And inner to the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscle layer, you have this layer of dense irregular connective tissue, which is called the submucosa. Then inside you have areolar connective tissue. The zone of areolar connective tissue is called mucosa and see how the surface of mucosa which is facing the cavity what do you call the cavity of the intestine this is where the food is passing this cavity through which the food passes is referred to as the lumen yes or no now the lining of the uh, mucosa that is facing the lumen has finger like projections which are referred to as villi so if this is the mucosa on the inner surface you have finger like projections which are referred to as villi and as you can see between the villi you have these depressions just like in the stomach we saw between the rugae there were depressions in these depressions there are special intestinal glands which are called as the crypts of libacan isn't it so crypts of libacan are the intestinal glands which are found in the inner layer of mucosa and the inner layer of mucosa is made up of these finger like projections which are referred to as villi the depressions between the villi have intestinal glands in them and i told you the name of the intestinal gland is crypt of libacan okay the depressions in the stomach had what they had uh, the gastric glands or the gastric bits isn't it so here i'm highlighting the depressions for you see these depressions um, which are found between the finger like projections and these depressions contain in them the intestinal glands which are referred to as the crypts of libacan so this gives you the outline of the histology of the gut or the alimentary canal Digestive glands, we have salivary glands. Let us start off with the salivary glands. We have three major salivary glands as you can see in the picture. The largest salivary gland is in front of your ear. It is referred to as the parotid gland. The parotid gland opens into the oral cavity through a duct which is referred to as the uh, Stenson's duct isn't it and then at the angle of your lower jaw you have the submandibular or the submaxillary gland which opens into your oral cavity through a duct which is called the Wharton's duct and then we have what is referred to as the uh, sublingual gland that is present immediately below your tongue and they open through fine ducts which are referred to as the ducts of Rivinus. So totally you can see three because in this diagram you are seeing the side view of the face but there are three on the other side. So remember that salivary glands are totally three pairs and the salivary glands secrete something which is referred to as saliva. Saliva has a slightly acidic pH of 6.7 very important and it has lot of electrolytes it has mucin which is a glycoprotein it has lysozyme which is an antibacterial enzyme present in it and most importantly it has an enzyme that is required for starch digestion it is called tyalin or salivary amylase and usually we produce about 1 to 1.5 liters of saliva per day so remember that the saliva production capacity or the volume of saliva that is produced per day is about 1 to 1.5 liters that is 1000 to 1500 ml pH and then mucin, lysozyme and tyalin and it has lot of electrolytes like there is sodium, there is potassium, there is chloride, there is bicarbonate ion okay and tyalin is nothing but I told you tyalin is the technical name and it is referred to as the tyalin is nothing but so I'm writing it here for you tyalin is nothing but the salivary amylase and this salivary amylase helps in digestion of starch okay now in the stomach I had told you that if this is the stomach all of you remember in the stomach I had told you that there are folds which are referred to as the rugae in between the rugae there are depressions and these depressions are referred to as the gastric pits so this is a gastric pit or a gastric gland that is nothing but a depression between the rugae so remember the stomach wall is like this 
and then there are folds which are referred to as the rugae in between the folds there are depressions and these depressions contain glands which are referred to as the gastric glands gastric glands contain parietal cells which secrete the concentrated hcl and intrinsic factor intrinsic factor is very important for the reabsorption of vitamin b12 in your intestine although it is produced in the stomach it acts on your intestine it helps you to absorb vitamin b12 efficiently from your cells i mean from your food so parietal cells are also called auxentic cells then you have the most important cells of your gastric gland which are called the chief cells or the peptic cells or the zymogen cells now these chief cells or the peptic cells of the zymogen cells are those cells which secrete the two major enzymes which are present in your gastric juice the secretions of the gastric gland is called the gastric juice which are the two major enzymes one is referred to as the pepsinogen and one is referred to as the prorenin so remember it is a renin with a double n because there is another enzyme a hormone called renin of the kidney which is with a single n so here this is spelt with a double n so pepsinogen and prorenin are both inactive enzymes we will see later how they become active they are produced by the chief cells or the peptic cells or the zymogen cells the enteroendocrine cells the enteroendocrine cells are also referred to as the argentafin cells now there are three different types of enteroendocrine cells one is referred to as the d cells one is referred to as the enterocrinin cells and one are referred to as the g cells okay so d cells secrete an, uh, a hormone that is called somatostatin which inhibits the uh, which inhibits the secretion of insulin and glucagon in your pancreas enterocrinin cells secrete two important substances active chemicals which are referred to as histo histamine which helps in dilating the blood vessels of your stomach and serotonin which helps in constricting the blood vessels of your stomach vasodilator and vasoconstrictor and the g cells secrete a very important stomach hormone remember usually if they ask you which is the hormone of your stomach you have to write gastrin now this gastrin will act on the chief cells and it will stimulate the chief cells to start producing the enzymes the enzymes are pepsinogen and prorenin it will also act on the gastric the parietal cells and stimulates the production of concentrated hcl so basically the gastrin is a hormone which stimulates the release of gastric juice okay then you have your liver and gall bladder now you have ducts which are coming out of your liver you know that your liver is the largest exocrine gland in your body and the liver produces a secretion which is referred to as the bile isn't it and we produce about 800 to 1000 ml of bile every day and from the liver you have about this bile which contains pigments which are referred to as the bilirubin and we have the biliverdin so remember the pigments and then there are lot of bile salts in the bile that are present and then there is lot of cholesterol molecules in the bile juice and of course we have phospholipids also along with them but what we don't have in the bile juice all of you remember there are no enzymes bile juice does not contain any enzyme so it is a digestive secretion which does not have any digestive enzymes so the ducts which are coming out of the liver are called the common hepatic ducts so remember liver is somewhere situated over here i'm just showing you an outline like this okay this is the liver so i'm going to write here as liver and below the liver you have this greenish organ that is called the gall bladder so all of you understand the duct system here from the liver you have the common hepatic duct the common hepatic duct receives a duct from the gall bladder that is called the cystic duct and it becomes a common bile duct the common bile duct comes all the way down and notice that it is receiving the duct of the pancreas this is the pancreatic duct the main pancreatic duct and this main pancreatic duct for your knowledge it is referred to as the duct of wersung the main duct there is another accessory duct as you can see here which is opening separately onto the duodenum this accessory duct may not be present in all humans it is called the duct of santorini and notice how the bile duct so let me show you here so the bile duct is coming down and then it receives the opening from the pancreatic duct from this is from the pancreas okay pancreas and this is coming from the liver 
so the bile duct is coming down it receives the opening from the pancreatic duct it forms a common duct now this common duct is referred to as the hepatopancreatic duct so remember the fusion of the bile duct and the pancreatic duct results in the formation of a common duct called the hepatopancreatic duct Now this hepatopancreatic duct, notice how it is opening into the duodenum. Now this C-shaped portion of your small intestine is referred to as the duodenum. And it opens and just before it opens into the duodenum, it is covered by the walls are provided with a ring of muscles which regulate the opening and closing. And this is referred to as the sphincter wherever you see this ring of muscle it is referred to as the sphincter so here it is referred to as the sphincter of ordi okay so the common hepatopancreatic duct opens into which part of the intestine is this this is the duodenum this curved portion the c-shaped portion of the intestine is called the duodenum it opens into the duodenum and at the point of opening it is guarded by a sphincter a ring of muscles that is referred to as the sphincter of audi so remember the duct which is coming out of the pancreas which is the pancreatic duct or the duct of versung and the duct coming out of the liver which is the common bile duct as in it also receives not the common bile duct here it is hepatic duct and it receives what duct the cystic duct from the gallbladder then it becomes a common bile duct cbd refers to common bile duct okay so hepatic duct receives the cystic duct this is the cystic duct from the gallbladder and then it becomes a common bile duct and then it unites with the pancreatic duct to form the hepatopancreatic duct which opens into the duodenum see here you can all see this opening and see it is guarded by a sphincter the sphincter is referred to as the sphincter of ordi okay in the intestine i had told you that there are finger like projections referred to as villi between the villi you have depressions i had told you you have crypts of libocon which are called the intestinal glands in the intestinal glands you have goblet cells which secrete a lot of um, mucus and then you have argentafin cells which may secrete certain hormones we will discuss some of the hormones later and panet cells it says in some sources that panet cells secrete lysozyme and also some sources say that panet cell is the one that actually secretes the intestinal enzymes that are responsible for the digestion of the food so three important cells goblet cells crypts of uh, the argentafin cells which secrete hormones that are endocrine and panet cells which secrete enzymes and the digestive enzymes as well as if you consider other sources an antibacterial enzyme which is referred to as lysozyme now physiology of digestion now first you take your food in your mouth isn't it now in the mouth under the influence of saliva so the first thing i'm going to talk about here is in your mouth only starch digestion takes place 30 percent of the starch gets digested in your mouth at the ph of 6.8 slightly acidic ph in the presence of salivary amylase starch is a polysaccharide it gets converted into a disaccharide that means starch is a beaded structure with many 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 monosaccharide units but maltose is only two monosaccharides saccharide unit so a polysaccharide gets broken down into a disaccharide in the mouth with the help of salivary amylase now we are going to talk about the digestion which happens in the intestine now in the intestine here i'm going to talk about the digestion that happens with the help of most importantly the pancreatic juice Okay, now before I go into this, I realized we should first talk about what happens in the stomach, isn't it? So I'm going to talk about stomach first and then I'm going to go to the digestion mediated by pancreatic juice in the intestine. Now in the stomach, what happens is you know that there are two inactive enzymes. One is called pepsinogen. The chief cells secrete pepsinogen and one is called proranin. When you say words like, when you hear words like gen and pro, it means they're inactive. Both of them in the presence of concentrated HCL, they get converted into active enzymes. Now, which I'm putting a star mark over here. Pepsin is the active enzyme and renin is an active enzyme in this case. Renin mostly acts on milk protein that is referred to as casein. So it is mostly active only in infants. So it acts on milk protein that is referred to as casein. Now, what does pepsin do? 
pepsin acts on the protein that you have chewed and which you have swallowed the protein that is present in your food the protein is acted upon by pepsin remember that pepsin has now become activated because of concentrated hcl it gets broken down into derived proteins that are called proteosis plus peptones proteosis and peptones are simpler proteins derived from the major proteins that are present in your food so this is what happens in your stomach so not all the protein gets digested and remember in your stomach only protein digestion takes place okay of course there are reports of some enzymes which are present in your stomach which may help in lipid digestion called gastric lipase okay but majorly it is the protein digestion that happens pepsin breaks down protein into proteosis and peptones now further where does the food enter the food enters from your stomach into your intestine in your intestine the first juice that it mixes with is bile and pancreatic juice we are not talking about bile here because bile does not have any enzymes in it i will come to later what the bile exactly does now remember all of you i told you that bile does not have any enzymes so what happens when food mixes with bile but bile has something which is referred to as the bile salts so what these bile salts do is they act on the larger fat droplets and they convert them into smaller fat droplets and this process which is done by bile is referred to as emulsification so the job of bile salts is only to break down it is more or less a physical process there is no involvement of enzyme so remember in the intestine your food mixes with bile as well as it mixes with the pancreatic juice and where has the food come from the uh, where, where has the food come from it has come from your stomach that's why i spoke of stomach first and now the food enters into the intestine and once your food enters into the intestine first it is acted upon by the bile where bile carries out the process which is referred to as emulsification i told you you produce about 800 to 1000 ml of bile per day isn't it so this is about the emulsification process and then we shall talk about what exactly does the pancreatic juice do just like your saliva you produce about 1 to 1.5 liters of pancreatic juice per day now in your pancreatic juice you all have to know the enzymes about these arrows whatever is mentioned about the arrows those are the enzymes if you know them only you can remember the equations so all these four reactions reaction 1 reaction 2 reaction 3 reaction 4 are all because of enzymes present in what present in pancreatic juice so proteins which are still not digested which came from your stomach and proteosis and peptones i told you which came from your stomach under the influence of pepsin they will be acted upon by three enzymes present in pancreatic juice which are protein digesting enzymes called trypsin chymotrypsin and carboxypeptidase and they will be converted into simplest proteins which have two amino acids and a peptide bond between them so these are called as dipeptides so how protein digestion happens the first equation pertains to protein digestion so pancreatic juice helps in digestion of almost all components of food the second equation pertains to carbohydrate digestion the third equation pertains to fat digestion and the last equation pertains to nucleic acid digestion that means all the components of your food are getting digested with the help of pancreatic juice so we saw protein digestion ultimately proteins proteosis and peptones are broken down into simplest of proteins which are called dipeptides which have only two amino acids connected by peptide bond what happens to carbohydrates now starch i told you only 30 percent of the starch got digested in your mouth so the remaining 70 percent of the starch in your intestine it is acted upon by pancreatic amylase don't confuse it between salivary amylase amylase that is present in saliva is called salivary amylase but this amylase is present in pancreatic juice so we give it a special name we call it as amylopsin the name given to the amylase present in the pancreatic juice is amylopsin it is called pancreatic amylase 
okay so amylase which is basically the pancreatic amylase will break down starch again into maltose which are two sugar units or two beaded structures connected by glycosidic bond notice for proteins i said it was a peptide bond for carbohydrates i'm using the word glycosidic bond so a complex polysaccharide i mean a complex carbohydrate like a polysaccharide is converted into a simpler one that is called disaccharide by pancreatic amylase which is called amylopsin so that completes carbohydrate digestion now how does fat digestion happen with the help of pancreatic juice pancreatic juice contains an enzyme called pancreatic lipase the name given to the pancreatic lipase is the steapsin or the stepsin and this i am going to call it as pancreatic lipase so what does pancreatic lipase do it acts on the smaller fat droplets where did the smaller fat droplets come from remember bile converted larger fat droplets into smaller or tinier fat droplets by a process which is referred to as emulsification these smaller fat droplets are acted upon by lipases they are broken down into simpler lipids like diglycerides and monoglycerides which are basically composed of glycerol and fatty acids and the last one is nucleic acid digestion nucleic acid again it is always better to write it as pancreatic nucleases i will give you another name for the pancreatic nucleases the pancreatic nucleases are referred to as the polynucleotidases okay the polynucleotidases are of two types some of them act on dna they are referred to as dnases and some of them act on rna they are referred to as rnases because the food that we consume has dna and rna in it and that also needs to get digested and therefore you have these polynucleotidases which break down the dna or rna into simpler units monomer units called nucleotides which are further broken down into nucleosides i hope you know that a nucleotide has a sugar plus a phosphate group plus nitrogen base if you remove the phosphate here minus phosphate you are left with only sugar and nitrogen base and that sugar plus nitrogen base is referred to as a nucleoside so four major equations the process of digestion happening in the help of in the intestine with the help of pancreatic juice so in this one slide we have learnt about what happens in the stomach and once the food comes into your intestine it mixes with the bile what happens with the bile and four equations for what happens with the help of pancreatic juice like i said above the arrow you have to learn the names of the enzymes which are all the enzymes which are present in which juice in this case pancreatic juice then further you can imagine where does the pancreatic uh, the food now go the food is still in the intestine now the food mixes with the next secretion which is secreted by your crypts of lieberkuhn which is now called as the intestinal juice the intestinal juice that is secreted by the crypts of lieberkuhn is called the succus entericus now all these equations which i am showing over here are all those which are mediated by the intestinal juice which is the succus entericus see the enzymes of the succus entericus the first one the first equation is protein digestion the second third and fourth equation let me make it as the second set is carbohydrate digestion the third equation is nucleic acid digestion and the fourth one is fat digestion it is a continuation of what happened with the help of pancreatic juice so what did we get from pancreatic digestion that is pancreatic juice enzymes we got dipeptides in protein now there is an enzyme called dipeptidases or amino peptidases which are present in the succus entericus which break down dipeptides into simplest units which are called amino acids and these are the most basic building blocks of proteins see successfully complex has become has become broken down into the simplest unit that means the goal of digestion has been accomplished isn't it then three enzymes are there for carbohydrate digestion in the succus entericus or the intestinal juice secreted by the crypts of lieberkuhn one is referred to as maltase and one is referred to as lactase and one is referred to as sucrase so maltase breaks down maltose into glucose two units of glucose lactose is broken down by lactase into glucose and one unit of galactose sucrase breaks down sucrose into one unit of glucose and fructose then we saw we got nucleotides 
and nucleosides from the pancreatic juice action in the intestinal juice there are two enzymes one is called nucleotidases and one is called nucleosidases nucleotidases break down nucleotides into nucleosides meaning it converts sugar plus phosphate plus nitrogen base it removes the phosphate over here so we are left with only sugar plus nitrogen base now it splits the sugar and the nitrogen base with the help of net nucleosidases so we get individual sugar and individual bases we got di and monoglyceride in the previous slide that is in the action after the action of pancreatic juice both are acted upon by it is very important to note here because there are more than one lipases that we talk about it is important that you write it down that these are the intestinal lipases so intestinal lipases are the ones which break down the di and monoglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol so ultimately we get all the simplest compounds i'm going to highlight all the simple ones that is amino acids glucose galactose fructose sugars bases fatty acids and glycerol all these are absorbed where now they enter into your blood so that they could be absorbed into the blood which is why the process of digestion happened these substances are now carried by your blood to different parts of your body there are a lot of hormones which you should remember that means your digestive tract is also an endocrine organ it is capable of secreting lot of hormones for example your stomach produces a hormone called gastrin the gastrin stimulates the release of gastric juice and it also ensures that there's movement in your stomach and your stomach produces lot of concentrated hcl enterogastron is gastric inhibitory peptide secreted by endocrine cells remember in the crypts of liberkan there are endocrine cells called argentafin cells or enteroendocrine cells isn't it yes or no so those cells secrete enterogastron as the name itself indicates it inhibits the gastric acid secretion and the gastric motility the first ever hormone that was discovered also happens to be a hormone of your duodenum again secreted by endocrine cells and this secretin stimulates the secretion of bicarbonates into the pancreatic juice why bicarbonates because your acid the stomach acid the food is mixed with the stomach acid has reached into your intestine it can damage the lining of the intestine as a result there is lot of bicarbonate that is poured into the pancreatic juice secretin also increases the secretion of bile and at the same time it inhibits the secretion of gastric juice and inhibits the motility of the stomach cholecystokinin is involved in release of bile from the gall bladder and release of digestive enzymes from the pancreas again it is secreted by the small intestinal endocrine cells duodenin is secreted by endocrine cells of the duodenum it stimulates the brunner's glands i told you the brunner's or the brunner's glands are located in the submucosa of the small intestine and they are secreting enormous amounts of alkaline mucus so duodenin stimulates the brunner's gland in order to secrete a lot of mucus so that the food is mixed with the mucus it helps in lubrication it also helps in neutralizing the acidity of the chyme that has just come in from the stomach then we have enterocrinin which is an in is a hormone secreted by endocrine cells of the small intestine enterocrinose means to stimulate they stimulate the crypts of liberkan to secrete intestinal juice i told you already the scientific name or the technical name of intestinal juice is succus entericus vasoactive intestinal peptide vasoactive because it broadens the blood vessels in the peripheral parts of your digestive system vasodilation and it also inhibits your gut motility and the secretion of gastric acid in your stomach and the stomach motility is inhibited then we have villikinin villi are finger like projections the villi is usually stimulated to move around so that it can absorb all the food substances very easily with the help of a hormone called villikinin secreted by the small intestine somatostatin is secreted by the delta cells of the pancreas and also if you remember in the stomach there are cells which are referred to as the d cells which i had told you in the gastric pits which secrete this somatostatin they inhibit the secretion of insulin and glucagon and they also stimulate uh, they also inhibit the absorption of nutrients so that the digestion process can happen until the complete digestion is not happen the absorption process does not take place because of the somatostatin hormone the last one is referred to as 
pancreatic polypeptide now pancreatic polypeptide is actually secreted by the f cells of islets of langerhans in the pancreas there is a gland which is referred to as the islet of langerhan now these islets of langerhans are actually the endo sorry yeah the endocrine parts of the pancreas because all of you remember pancreas is a compound gland a compound gland means it has both exocrine and endocrine part and this particular pancreatic polypeptide secreted by the f cells of the pancreatic um, islets of langerhans will inhibit the release of pancreatic juice of course when there is no food in the intestine there is no point of releasing these pancreatic juice and therefore it inhibits the release of pancreatic juice absorption of nutrients 90% of all absorption takes place in the small intestine of course absorption also happens in the stomach and the large intestine in the stomach water salts alcohol and drugs are absorbed mostly water and products of bacterial digestion such as amino acids and vitamins happen in the large intestine and even certain drugs are absorbed in the large intestine monosaccharides like glucose and galactose monosaccharides are nothing but the building blocks of carbohydrates glucose and galactose are absorbed by active facilitated transport that means they require indirectly the use of atp molecule now for example this is the cavity of your intestine where food is getting digested and this is the cell which is present on the villus okay and this is your blood vessel into which the food needs to get absorbed so now for example there is glucose and galactose there are special transport proteins in the membrane of the cell lining your intestine now this is the cavity of your intestine where the digestion is happening and this is a mucosal cell it is the cell of the villus of your intestine there are special proteins called carrier proteins which help in the transport of glucose and galactose and that's why whenever a carrier protein is involved we call this kind of a diffusion as facilitated diffusion or a facilitated transport but why is it called active transport especially glucose and galactose when they need to get absorbed they cannot go in on their own but they require a helper ion which is sodium ion and this sodium ion needs to help uh, this uh, uh, entry of glucose and galactose through this transporter into the mucosal cell and once the glucose and galactose molecule is sitting safely inside the mucosal cell then there will be another facilitated transporter which will carry them from the cell into the blood stream so this is the blood okay so here they require the help of sodium and wherever sodium is involved there is use of atp that's why it is referred to as facilitated active transport but remember from the lumen now this is the microvilli on the cell of the mucosa so this is the cell with the nucleus like i told you from the lumen to enter into the cell they require the help of sodium ion who requires the help of sodium ion glucose and galactose so this is imagine the glucose molecule and this is the galactose molecule for them to enter into the cell they require the help of sodium chloride uh, i mean sodium but i told you once they enter into the cell in order to reach the blood they don't require sodium help but they require a transport protein again so here it is passive because there is no involvement of sodium so from the cavity of the intestine into the cell it is active facility facilitated transport because there is use of na plus and wherever na plus is entering there is use of atp and from the cell into the blood vessel there is no use of uh, na plus but there is a use of carrier transport so we should use the word passive but since carrier trans uh, carrier protein is involved it is referred to as the facilitated transport okay fructose mannose and amino acids even to enter into the cell they don't need sodium so we call this as sodium independent absorption there is absolutely no help taken by the sodium so if sodium is not involved there is no atp involved all of you remember there is a direct link between entry of sodium into the cell and the consumption of energy in the form of atp and here since fructose mannose and amino acids are entering into the mucosal cell or the cell of your intestine without sodium's help we call it as passive facilitated transport 
okay and then all these substances once they collect inside the cell i told you ultimately they enter into the blood capillaries and among them the most rapidly transporting one is glucose but however sorry galactose however galactose requires sodium support and therefore it requires energy and what type of facilitated transport it is it is active facilitated transport absorption of fatty acids and glycerol now for example again this is the cell of your intestine which is ready to absorb the food where is the digestion process happening the digestion process is happening in the cavity of your intestine which is referred to as lumen and where the absorption needs to be done into the blood this is the wall of your intestine where you have this cell what do we call this cell we call this cell as the mucosal cell so now what happens for fatty acid and glycerol is they get digested into tiny droplets i told you larger fat droplets are converted into smaller fat droplets the smaller fat droplets that are obtained by emulsion classification of fats remember bile converts larger fat droplets into smaller fat droplets this conversion of larger fat droplets into smaller fat droplets is called emulsification and this is referred to as a micelle or a micelle isn't it now the micelle is absorbed into the mucosal cell it can enter because it is micelle is having a coat of hydrophobic molecules which are readily soluble in the plasma membrane so they can on their own without the help of any carrier protein they can cross the cell membrane and they will enter into the cell now once they enter into the cell these tiny micelles which are there are taken up by the endoplasmic reticulum and in the endoplasmic reticulum and the golgi complex specifically they enter and they get packaged into these droplets which are covered by a protein on the outside and these droplets which now are fat droplets covered with protein they are referred to as chylomicrons so micelles get converted into chylomicron and chylomicron does not enter into the blood it enters into the lymphatic vessel so remember the chylomicrons are not entering into the blood but they go into the lymphatic vessel where is the lymph present if this is the villi of the small intestine inside the villi there will be a lymph vessel what is this lymph vessel called this is referred to as the lacteal so the chylomicrons are absorbed directly into the lacteal surrounding the lacteal however there is a capillary network the capillary network does not absorb the fat substances so please remember the fat substances are not absorbed into the blood capillary but most of them so what i'm showing you here is the blood capillary system so around the lacteal you will find the capillary system in the finger like projection of your small intestine i have shown one finger like structure so i'm calling it villus so remember the micelles are packaged into protein coated vesicles called chylomicrons which enter not into the blood but into the lymph and where is the lymph present lymph is present in the lymphatic vessel inside the villus the name given to the lymphatic vessel inside the villus is referred to as the lacteal okay absorption of water occurs very very uh, by simple uh, osmosis wherever there is higher concentration water moves from dilute solution to concentrated solution that's how water moves from the lumen to the mucosal cell from the mucosal cell to the uh, blood capillary absorption of salts or electrolytes mostly calcium absorption happens in the duodenum it may happen either by simple diffusion where atp is not used or by active transport that is atp is used iron absorption takes place in the duodenum and bile salts if there are any in remaining in the food because bile salts like we saw they are the ones which are secreted by the bile juice they are reabsorbed into the blood and they are sent back into the liver in the uh, in the ileum okay water soluble vitamins and uh Uh, alcohol are absorbed by diffusion in the small intestine however the alcohol absorption begins in the stomach and it is greatly absorbed later in the small intestine 
disorders of the digestive system appendicitis appendicitis is inflammation of the worm like appendix that is present at the junction in the cecum actually the first expanded part of the large intestine isn't it if it is something happens over a short period of time it is called as acute appendicitis or it is a chronic app appendicitis if it is happening over a very very long period of time and ultimately it requires removal of this appendix which is referred to as the appendectomy okay then there is cirrhosis of liver is a condition that is seen in the case of uh, mostly those who are consuming excess amount of alcohol there is death of liver cells much of the liver cells die and they're replaced by fibrous tissue in the case of cirrhosis possible causes for cirrhosis like i told you is alcoholism sometimes hepatitis if it is in its last stages may lead to liver cirrhosis sometimes due to obstruction of the bile duct sometimes when the body's immune system starts destroying its own organ that is liver and sometimes it can also lead to heart failure where enough blood is not reaching the liver and that can also cause cardiac cirrhosis okay jaundice now jaundice is a disease of the liver again now there is deposition of a yellow pigment underneath the skin that is because the bilirubin and the biliverdin which are the bile pigments are not being destroyed i mean are not being excreted there is excessive destruction of rbcs but there is no proper disposal of bile pigments and therefore those bile pigments will deposit underneath the skin this can happen if there is a blockage in the gall bladder or the cystic duct or the bile duct there the bile will start getting collected and it will enter into the blood stream and it will get deposited in the white part of the eye in the nail and underneath the skin sometimes the liver is not capable of uh, getting rid of the bilirubin and the biliverdin so the liver is not able to utilize the bilirubin molecule and therefore it accumulates into the blood actually the bilirubin and biliverdin are bile pigments which are brought forth from the spleen to the liver if the liver cannot take it up then it is remaining in the blood and that is what causes jaundice sometimes there is excessive destruction of rbcs the liver cannot keep up with this rate of rbc destruction so much of the bilirubin remains in the blood that is called as hemolytic jaundice heartburn or pyrosis usually caused by regurgitation of contents of the stomach so that is if the stomach contents you all know that between the esophagus and the stomach i had told you that there is a valve or a sphincter can you recall and tell me what was the sphincter called it was called the cardiac sphincter it is a ring of muscles that is present at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach sometimes if this sphincter doesn't close properly the contents of the stomach can go back into the esophagus and this regurgitation causes heartburn and then you can see that it may also cause infection of the esophagus and wearing out of the inner wall of the esophagus there is a burning pain in the sternum behind the sternum sometimes it may be mistaken to be a pain in the uh, it can be mistaken to be a condition of the heart as well and then there is a also accompanied by sensation of acid or bitter fluid in the stomach so then the last part in this chapter is protein energy malnutrition if a person is suffering or a child is suffering from protein deficiency alone it is called kwashiorkor if a person or a child is suffering from protein as well as carbohydrate and fat deficiency that is protein and calorie deficiency then we refer to it referred to it as marasmus so remember that kwashiorkor results in weak muscles thin limbs and retarded growth of the body and the brain and there is pot bellied appearance and there is diarrhea and in case of marasmus the tissue proteins will start getting degraded and therefore the limbs become very thin the ribs become very prominent ribs are there and there is very dry wrinkled and thin skin that is visible and diarrhea is again a feature of marasmus okay so this completes the quick synopsis of digestive system thank you everybody